This is Belzona, Mississippi. Uh, and this picture was taken in 1939. It's an African-American man uh, apparently going to the movies. You can see him there in the hat, right? See him sort of in silhouette. Uh, below him, written on the side of the stairs outside the theater, it says, colored admission, 10 cents. Because this man is black in Belzona, Mississippi in 1939, he has to use a separate door and he has to sit way up in the balcony. In Mississippi now, of course, and everywhere in the country, theaters are integrated and today this man could sit anywhere he wants. But this particular theater is gone. Uh, there is no regular place to go see a movie in Belzona, Mississippi anymore. This uh, is an attempt to buy lunch at a Woolworths lunch counter in 1960 in Greensboro, North Carolina. This was the first of the 1960s lunch counter sit-ins. Today, in our more integrated country, Americans of any race could sit down and order, even take their time going over the menu in a place like this, except for the fact that that store, where those particular protesters wanted to eat back in 1960, that store closed a long time ago. Finally, a few years ago, a civil rights museum was able to open in what had been the long, vacant, old storefront from that Woolworths. And here we have another attempt to buy lunch, uh, this time at a Woolworths in Jackson, Mississippi, the state capital. This was in 1963. Uh, this time the group included white people and African Americans sitting down together at that lunch counter in violation of both the unofficial social code and the official law and bringing upon themselves the outrage and ridicule and abuse of the mob that gathered around them. Today that same mixed race group could eat in that same Woolworths without fearing for their safety because that place, like all American restaurants, would be an integrated restaurant now. They put a historic marker at that site just the other day, 50 years after the sit-in at that Woolworths in Jackson, Mississippi. But I say they put a marker at the site instead of at that store, because as you can see from this picture, the store is gone. Uh, in its place is a bunch of redeveloped stuff, including a parking garage. That old place with all the restaurants crowded around in that neighborhood, not just the Woolworths, um, that place is gone. The southern part of the United States uh, did get forced to abolish its segregation laws, but it was a bloody, bloody fight. Throughout the old Confederacy, white people were asked, first as a matter of conscience, and then finally they were ordered as a matter of justice to integrate on racial lines. And when the white people who had control of the laws and the government and the schools and the businesses, when the fight to hold on to segregation laws was a lost fight, and they knew they had no choice but to integrate the society that they lived in. In many cases, instead of going through with that and living through that kind of change, a lot of them just decided to quit that society. They gave up public pools and public schools and, in some cases, movie theaters. They gave up whole cities and moved away. They called it white flight, right? The census from 1960, for instance, records a Jackson, Mississippi that was majority white, almost two to one. By 1990, Jackson's population had made the turn toward getting smaller and it was getting much blacker. By 2010, Jackson, Mississippi had become the second most African-American city in the nation. White people in the previously legally segregated South, and really across the nation, abandoned places rather than see them change. But white people were not the only ones who moved away. From roughly the First World War through the 1970s, our country experienced what they call the Great Migration. That's a term that refers specifically in this country to a great migration of people whose parents and grandparents and great-grandparents were slaves in the South. Because even though slavery had technically ended as a lawful practice in this country, it was replaced in the South with sharecropping and Jim Crow segregation enforced by violence and by disenfranchisement. So, so all of those many descendants of slaves picked up and moved, moved to the north for the relative, if imperfect, freedom to be found in places like Chicago and Oakland and Detroit and D.C. and New York. People who could leave left by the millions. Six million African Americans emigrated out of the south in the Great Migration from the 19-teens through the 1970s. Six million. In Isabel Wilkerson's History of the Great Migration, it's called The Warmth of Other Suns, she writes about how so many African Americans were leaving the South during that migration that white farmers and business owners in the South, in some cases, tried to pass laws to get black people to stay put because where else were they going to get cheap labor if they lost the disenfranchised, discriminated against African American population who had no choice but to work for next, uh, next to nothing. We know from historical records 
that the African Americans who left the South over the course of the Great Migration, they came from a whole range of socioeconomic backgrounds. But as it got on toward the 1950s, as we were several decades into that migration, the people who by then were leaving tended to be those who were at the higher end of the spectrum, tended to be those who had the benefit of education, who had the means to seek out and have a hope of getting new jobs in new states that they were going to move to. And education offered a way out. And a lot of Americans who had that, who were well-educated and who knew they would have reasonably good prospects that they could get themselves to elsewhere in this country with less discrimination, a lot of those people left because they could. But some of them stayed. And one of those people who definitely had the means to leave, the means to leave and the prospects to leave, but who stayed instead, was this man, Mr. Medgar Evers. He was born in Mississippi in 1925. Medgar Evers served in World War II. After the war, right around the time that he turned 30, Mr. Evers tried to attend the law school at the University of Mississippi at Ole Miss. Uh, but Ole Miss was not yet integrated, and the school turned him down on the basis of his race. He then became the first field secretary in his state for the NAACP. And at that time, that was a job that was not some kind of metaphor for bravery. It was the soul of bravery. Right at the outset of Mr. Evers' work in Mississippi, a 14-year-old boy was kidnapped off the porch of a store in a town called Money, Mississippi. He was taken, supposedly, in retaliation for him whistling or flirting or maybe just speaking to a woman who was white. The kid, uh, Emmett Till, was black, and he was 14 years old, and he was tortured and then shot, and then his body was dumped into the Tallahatchie River. When local law enforcement hesitated to prosecute anybody for the murder, it was Medgar Evers who took it upon himself to investigate that crime personally. The woman who Medgar Evers married, Merle Evers, says that her husband dressed in disguise when he was doing that investigation. He dressed as a field hand on his trips to go try to collect evidence for that crime. He was known to drive 100 miles an hour to get safely out of town and to try to shake anybody who was following him. That was what it took to be the field secretary for the NAACP in Mississippi in 1955. Medgar Evers was brave like that. He worked for voting rights in Mississippi before there was a Voting Rights Act, when registering to vote or trying to vote meant risking your life. And it particularly meant risking your life if you were trying to persuade others that they should register, that they should vote. Mr. Evers led boycotts of businesses that would not hire black workers or treat black customers equally. When Mississippians decided to try to integrate their lunch counters by just sitting down at one no matter what, just taking what was rained down on them for doing it, Medgar Evers made that protest possible in some major ways. He, he organized that sit-in at the Woolworths lunch counter in 1963. Medgar Evers is just one of those key Americans who at a key time in our country was willing to upset the way things had been so he could get everybody to the way things ought to be. He saw that as possible in the very difficult place where he lived in his very difficult own time. Now, for many of us who've gone overseas, and fought for this country, we fought for Mississippi, we fought for Alabama, we fought for North Carolina, we fought for Illinois, and we fought for every state in this union. Now, we're gonna stay here and see that the things that the mayor has said become a reality. Medgar Evers stayed in Jim Crow, Mississippi, although he could have left. It's not that it was wrong to leave, but he felt that for him it would be wrong to leave. And so that is where he was. He was in Mississippi 50 years ago today, 50 years ago tonight. 50 years ago was the day that Alabama gov Alabama's governor stood in the door at the University of Alabama and blocked the door with his body so that African-American students could not come in. It was the day that President Kennedy pleaded with the nation for a civil rights act, 50 years ago today. And 50 years ago tonight, just after midnight, with the Woolworths mob still fresh in the headlines, and the reports of the Alabama governor in the schoolhouse door, and President Kennedy making that speech on civil rights, with those reports not yet published in the morning papers, after midnight, 50 years ago, Medgar Everts was was killed. Mr. Evers was gunned down in his driveway in Jackson, Mississippi, as he pulled up to the house after an NAACP meeting ran late. The Evers had taught their three kids to drop to the floor at the sound of gunfire. And after they heard the shots that night and they hit the floor, they got up and they opened the door and there was Medgar Evers, husband, father, dying. His car keys were still in his hand, along with a stack of t-shirts that said, Jim Crow must go. There was no conviction in his murder for another 30 years. Medgar Evers was 
never as famous as Martin Luther King or Rosa Parks or Malcolm X. They did make the Evers home into a museum not long ago. And if you want, you can go there. You can stand in the driveway. You can see it for yourself. Uh, the locals just ask that you be respectful. You are visiting a place where a family lived. A few months ago in Mississippi, Medgar Evers' widow, now Merle Evers Williams, uh, she talked about her husband's decision to stay in Mississippi, knowing at the time what could happen to him. She said, quote, he always said, Mississippi is my home. I love the place where I was born, and I will do whatever I have to do to make it the best place in the United States of America. He would say to me, Mississippi is going to be the best place in the country. And I told him, you have to be out of your mind. There is no way Mississippi can become anything better than what it is, and quite honestly, I do not want any part of it, and I do not know how you can do what you do. And he said, because it is the state of my birth, and I believe in it. And he gave his life, not wanting to die, but he gave it gladly to help lift this state to where it is today. End quote. For Medgar Evers, he decided that Mississippi was worth staying in when so many other people were leaving. Staying in and dying in. I think it was much harder for his family to accept his decision after what happened to him. And after his death, they left Mississippi. They joined the Great Migration, in a sense, and they stayed away from the state for a long, long time. But last year, Medgar Evers' widow returned to Jackson after decades away. She returned to Jackson not just for a visit, but to live and to run the Medgar and Merle Evers Institute in Jackson, Mississippi. This week, for the 50th anniversary of his death, they unveiled new portraits of the two of them, the young Medgar Evers, who was, of course, outlived by his ideas, and the present day, Merle Evers Williams, who's trying to carry those ideas forward, including in the place where her late husband was most determined to see them take hold. Sometimes history feels very far away, but sometimes history comes back close enough to touch.